39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, written by over 40 different authors over a period of 1,400 years from all walks of life. Uh, princes, shepherds, scribes, priests, uh, a butler, um, fishermen, a king, uh, a doctor, uh, a brother of Jesus Christ himself, um, on and on the list goes. So there is a lot to be said. It is perfect. It is inerrant. That means it doesn't have any errors in it. It's infallible. That means it will not lead you astray. Um, it is clear in what it says. God does not speak in riddles. He wants us to understand the Bible. It's not a big puzzle book. Uh, he wants us to understand it. So there's a lot to be said for God's Word. There's a lot to be said for our response to God's Word. And so... Today, as we dig into uh, our text, uh, I'm going to hope to answer these three questions that I think are on your minds, at least sometime uh, they are, and uh, here they are. Who are you following, and who is following you? I don't mean that figuratively, I mean that literally. Who are you following, and who is following you? Second question that I want to uh, uh, answer through this text is why are we so fearful about sharing our faith? Why are we so fearful about speaking up for God? Uh, offering a gospel witness, having a gospel conversation. And then with all the plans that you and I have, uh, do those plans contain any part of the truth that Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. So here's the answer to that. Now we just sang a song and in that song we said this phrase and I hope we meant this phrase. I will make room for you. And then the refrain of that was to do whatever you want to. Now either we just were mimes and we didn't mean what we say or we meant what we just sang. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. So that, uh, that, that's a big uh, area that God has to work if you're saying to do whatever you want to. So here lies the answer to those questions that I just gave about being fearful of a gospel witness. Uh, who's following you and who are you following? Uh, what concern do you have of Jesus coming again? Uh, the answer lies within your attitude toward this book. The answer lies within your attitude toward the Word of God. This is the Lord's declaration. Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, I will look favorably on this kind of person, one who is humble, submissive in spirit, and who trembles at my word. Who trembles at my word. Last week we saw, as you're making your way, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I thank Corbin for reading our text earlier. Last week we dealt with 1 through 5. This week we're going to deal with 5 through 10. This is one of the nine letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament. Uh, he wrote nine letters to seven different churches. The interesting thing about this letter, above all of those other letters that he wrote, to all those other churches that he wrote to, the church at Thessalonica, he had not one bad word to say about this church. All the other books that he wrote, he had some rebuke, some reproof, some word of admonition to them to straighten out a problem that they were having. Not so with the, book, uh, the church here at Thessalonica. And so we talked last week about what qualities make the ideal church. And uh, this week we're going to continue that thought with the listening church. The listening church. So 
What qualities made up the ideal church? Last week we saw that there was one particular phrase that drove or drives uh, 1 through 5 last week and 5 through 10 this week. And it is this notion that Paul found thanks. Look with me there in verse 2. We always thank God. That's the key clause in this passage of scripture. We always give thanks to God for you. Now would to God that, every, like, that uh, somebody could say that about me. Everything about you, I just want to thank God for you. So he says he's going to do that in three different ways. Uh, he's going to uh, make mention of you constantly in prayers. He's going to recall some things. Uh, and then he's going to know some things. And so, you're there in verse 2. We always thank God for all of you making mention of you constantly in our prayers. That was the first thing. Second thing, we recall in the presence of God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope... Paul said, that makes me want to constantly recall you and to thank God for you. Then the last thing he says there in verse 4 is, For we know, we know something. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. As we said last week, we usually think in terms of election or choosing, as he uses the word there. We talk about it in terms of our election or choosing. Whatever you may think of that, that's a whole other sermon topic. But it's just interesting here that what he is saying is, I can look at you and tell, you, tell that you are chosen by God for several reasons. Your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by, by love, and your endurance uh, inspired by hope. I can look at you and know that you are a child of God. Now, that's just an interesting thought. Now, with that being said, is that all he had to say in this passage? No, or else I'd have to step down right now, but I'm not going to because he has more to say about this passage. They actually responded to the missionaries here. The missionaries would be Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They had a word from the Lord. And so, uh, whatever that word is, they listened to it. Uh, the word there uh, is going to be found in verse 5 in just a second. Now, what we're talking about is listening today. A listening church. I was reminded of this earlier uh, this week, just a few days ago. I'm not talking about this. Husbands, you can relate to this. I'm sitting in the recliner. My wife is sitting in the other recliner. And I'm, I'm looking at her, and she's talking to me. And uh, she's talking... And uh, she didn't say anything, and I know she understands what I'm saying here. She was talking to me, and uh, she got through talking, and I was, I'm doing this, and I'm making all the right motions, and then she said, uh, yeah, and, and what about that? <laughs> and I, I said, uh, what did you say? <laughs> the, the bad thing is, it didn't happen just once. It happened like three times in the course of that conversation. Now, that's embarrassing as a husband. That's embarrassing as somebody that says they love somebody else with all their heart. Now, how do you think God feels? When he speaks to us through his word, and we just... Hmm. I don't know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What if God said, now, what about it? And you would have to say, what was that again? Do we listen when God speaks? Are we listening to his word? Take a moment and look at your Bible. Just look at it as a book. It's a precious book. It's a book that... We take for granted. I'm Bible poor. I've got a copy of every translation that is known to man. Some in different languages. I'm Bible poor. I've got so many Bibles, some of them have dust on them. How tragic. 
I heard one time a story that was related to me about <clears throat> the country of Russia uh, during the uh, time of the Cold War when the Iron Curtain was up. People were so fearful of being arrested and having their word of God taken from them. You know what they would do? They would take pages of the Bible and they would rip them out and pass them to their neighbor so that just in case they got arrested they would at least have one page of the Word of God and they would know where to find it. But I've got 20 or 25 Bibles in my office. How many do you have? We have whole copies of the Word of God. And yet we pay lip service to it, acting like it's just a religious book. It is not just a religious book. Listen to what it's called. The Word of God. Now, if it's the Word of God, we should listen to it. We should pay heed to what it is saying. Paul helped this church to understand how God's word was working, specifically how it was working in them. And so he's going to show them and he's going to show us how we can listen to the word of God so that we might live the word of God. That's my point today. Listening to God's Word leads to living God's Word. And so when I say listening, I don't mean like Brother Tony was listening to Miss Terry the other night in the recliner where I'm just shaking my head. I'm talking about listening. Don't just... When James said this, don't just be a hearer of the Word. Be a doer of the Word. In the Hebrew mindset... If you don't act upon what you hear, you really didn't hear it. Don't just be a hearer, be a doer. So listening to God's word leads to living God's word. And the fact that this church listened fleshes itself out in three profound ways in this text. So let's look at it in those first three verses, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, listening and living God's word means that you will live an exemplary life. You will live an exemplary life. This is going to answer this question. Who are you following? And who is following you? Look at verse 5. He's going to say four things in these three verses that we need to pay attention to. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance, full conviction. You know how we lived among you for your benefit, and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord when, in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Man, they were listening to God's word, and God's word was working in them, and things were happening because they were listening. Maybe they weren't sure how to explain everything that was happening in their life. Well, Paul is going to point it out to them. Verse 5, he tells them, here's what the first thing they did. They received the word of God. And they did so, not just in word only. They were not just hearing it. They were doing it. They were not just listening for information, they were listening for transformation. It says, because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. They were able to look at their life and go, man, there's something about these people that are different from all these other people. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to... Uh, Determine what that is, but Paul's determining it for us. He says, here's the word of God came. And uh, it, it was interesting because it came in power, dunamis. And in the Holy Spirit, and with 
full conviction. They believed the message. And all God's people said. And they lived the message. Now, I could say, and all God's people said amen, but that would mean we'd have to live the message, right? It's one thing to say we're going to follow. It's a whole other thing to follow. The second thing uh, that occurs here is in verse 6. They followed their spiritual leaders. Now, who are you following and who is following you. They followed their spiritual leaders. And you yourselves, you Thessalonians, you became imitators of us, specifically Paul, Timothy, and Silas, but the church at large as well. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. You became, you watched our life and you followed the pattern of our life. You were not only imitators of the Lord. You were imitators of us because we were following the Lord. It, that's not just the young learning from the old. That's those that are following Christ. Having others follow them because they're following Christ. So who are you following? And who is following you? Hebrews 13.7 says this. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. Now, I'm saying this not just as your preacher, but I'm just saying this as a man of God who has spent his life doing what I do, growing up how I grew up. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. You called a pastor for a reason. Did you not? Why did you call him? To do the work of the ministry. No. I do the work of the ministry, but that's not why you called me. Because my calling is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word. You have a preacher. I have gifts. That's not to toot my horn. That's just to say this is what God has called me to do. You have recognized that to the degree that you've called me. So you should be here sitting under the teaching so that you can not just follow me, but follow me as I follow Christ. Come on now, I treat something there. Got awful quiet. God gifts people, gives gifts to people for certain things. And he has equipped your leaders so that you might follow them and imitate them as they imitate Jesus. You say, but you're just a man. Yeah, that is true. And I recognize my frailty. But even Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Who are you following? Who is following you? The third thing about this passage has the word of God, they listened to it, the Holy Spirit was manifesting himself and power was taking place. Uh, you know, you would just think, well, everything is wonderful if you love the Lord, right? Everything is just pie in the sky and everything is wonderful and the blessings of God are coming down. That is not what this text says. Verse 6, And you yourselves became imitators of us and and of the Lord when in spite of severe persecution. If you follow the Lord, you're going to be persecuted. I don't care what some TV preachers say. If you follow the Lord, you are going to be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, 
all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We're going to find out later in this text one of the reasons why uh, they were persecuted. Not only because they received God's word, they quit following idols. Well, some of their friends were probably still following idols, kind of ticked them off. And so they started to feel the heat because they weren't going along with the crowd. Well, faith is always tested. Your faith will always be tested. And a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. So will your faith stand up to the test when the persecution comes? The fourth thing in this text, in this little section here, uh, they were receiving God's word and God was doing wonderful things, marvelous things. Their lives were exemplary. They were, they were following the Lord and others were following them. And it says there in verse 7 that they were encouragement to other people, other churches. As a result, verse 7, as a result, because of all these things that he previously said in 5, 6, and 7. As a result, you became an example. See, they were following the example but now it says they became an example themselves. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. See, we, we are, here's, here's the truth in the church. You are either an encourager or you are a discourager. There's, there's no neutral ground. You either one or the other. That could be through the words of your lips. That could be through a lot of different things. The activities of your life. You're either encouragement or discouragement. Hebrews 10, 24. Whoever wrote that book is telling us that this ought to be true of all of us in the church. Let us consider one another. Let's think about one another for once. Let's, he's saying, stop thinking about yourself. Start thinking about one another. And he says, let us consider one another in order to provoke one another to love and good works. So what was the secret of eventually others following them? Here's what the secret was. Their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. Who are you following? Who are you following? I have some godly examples that I follow. I have some godly people that I listen to. I have some godly men that I podcast. Who are you following? Who is following you? Now, I'm not talking about social media. We should really care less who is following us on Facebook or who is following our tweets. I know more preachers that are more interested in their follows than they are about, well, following the Lord. I'm not talking about that kind of follow. What I am talking about is a you genuinely following the Lord genuinely following those that are worthy of following imbibing in the word of God so that eventually others will be following you listening and living God's word means you will live exemplary secondly listening and living God's word means you will live enthusiastically. Now, I'm not talking about just some fake kind of facade to put on at church and put a smile on your face and just act like you love Jesus even though the world's falling apart. I'm not talking about that enthusiasm. What I'm talking about is a genuine enthusiasm that occurs despite circumstances. We might call it joy. Look at, look at it there in verse 8. He's going to say three things here. For the word of the Lord rang out from you, 
not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Therefore, we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report what kind of rest reception we had from you how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God now just think about this <laughs> wouldn't you want this to be your testimony look at that first verse verse 8 for the word of the Lord now we talked about the word of the Lord earlier we talked about how we should value the word how uh, we should look at the word, how we should tremble at God's word. For the word of the Lord rang out from you. Wow. The word of the Lord was such a part of their life that the word of the Lord started ringing out from them. Literally trumpet forth. That word for rang out is where we get our English word echo. The word of the Lord was such a part of their life and the fact that they listened to it that it eventually reverberated out of their own being to the world. Man, if I was a Pentecostal right here, this is where you would insert a shout. He said, it rang out from you. See, they received the gospel message, the word, and now they're not... The, it's gone past receiving it. Now they're transmitting it. And it's each one of them. And it's every one of them as a part of a church. Paul says this is occurring. Man, that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. Where everybody is affected by the word. He says in the latter half of there, verse 8, The news of their faith has gone out. Their labor of faith. It's gone out into the world. Their testimony, see, some people are following behind them, following after them, but their testimony is going out before them. That's the kind of testimony that I want to have. How can that be? Well, here's how it be. All they are doing is obeying what Jesus told them to do before he left. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded them, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, that's a lot of stuff to do. No, there's only one command in that verse, and that is make disciples. And here's how you make disciples. You go, you baptize, and you teach. Only one command, and that's what they're doing. They are making disciples. Who is a disciple? A disciple is a learner, but a disciple is a follower. They are being followed because people are observing that they are listening to the Word of God. And, well, things are happening. Great things, unexplainable things. That's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. Do you realize... We talk about sometimes this is the job of the preacher. This is the job of the deacons. And then <clears throat> we should have like revivals. Because this is what, this is our expectation of a revival. And this is why we do this and this is why we do that. <clears throat> and we assume that the church is going to grow when the pastor's doing what he should do. The deacons are doing what they should do. We're having revivals and having evangelists come in to light us up and excite us. And we're thinking that's how you grow a church. That's not how you grow a church. Growth can occur from those things. But most growth that takes place in a church, 70 to 80 percent of church growth takes place when the people of God share their faith with their friends. That's where most church growth. Get that again. 70 to 80 percent. You just sharing what you know about, well, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll mess up. I'll stumble. Uh, they'll ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Um, they'll, they'll start talking about weird stuff. I'll make them angry. Yes. You may do all of those things. And by the way, 
you don't necessarily have to know one scripture. You're a witness. A witness, all he has to do when he gets on the stand is do what? This is what happened to me. That's all you need to know. This is what happened to me. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. November 1973, I walked the aisle at Kenshire Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, and I gave my life to Christ because I realized that I was a sinner separated from God, and I was on my way to hell, and I needed Jesus to help me. And on the, in that moment, on that Sunday night, he gloriously saved me. Now, that was a testimony. That was a witness. I didn't use one verse. That's all you have to do. Sharing it with your friends. See, God ordains the end. That's salvation. But God also ordains the means. This is a means. A revival is a means. Sunday school is a means. But our personal sharing of our faith is also a means. Notice uh, in verse 9, uh, it says, For they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Well, there's the answer to five. Why were they being persecuted? Because uh, they left the old way alive. That's why. They weren't worshiping idols. They were worshiping the one true and living God. See, here's the... Here's the Spiritual mathematical equation for this text here. Preaching the gospel equals persecution, which equals growth. That's the way it works. See, <laughs> there are many times when we pray as a people, as a nation, as a country, we pray for us not to be persecuted. People on the other side of the planet who are being persecuted, that's not what they pray. Because they know when the persecution ceases, the world will come flooding in. You know why? Because persecution reveals the true from the false. And everybody that's a fake Christian is going to turn tail and run. Because why would you be persecuted for something that's not real and for something that you don't really believe? Sharing the gospel, being persecuted, church grows. If you're looking, just in case, if you're looking for a church, don't go to the one that's nearest you. Go to the one that's nearest the Bible. That's how you decide to go to a church. Not the one that's closest in location, but the one that is closest to the scriptures. Is the word in you so much so that it is just reverberating out of you? Lastly, listening and living God's word means you will live expectantly. See, their, their work of faith proved the fact that they were chosen. Their labor of love made them exemplary and enthusiastic. Their endurance of hope made them expect that the Lord was going to come back. Look at verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now what this is telling me is this. I'm not supposed to be looking for signs. I'm supposed to be looking for the Savior. I'm not, I'm not gauging the spiritual temperature of this world. I'm looking to the skies. When they worshipped idols, they didn't have any hope. <laughs> but now they have a blessed hope, as verse 10 says, because he raised him from the dead. I serve a living God. Matthew 6, 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Romans 9, 26. There, there they will be called the sons of the living God. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. For we are the temple of the living God. 2 Corinthians 3, 3 
tells us that we are indwelt by the Spirit of the living God. 1 Timothy 3.15 says we are a part of the church of the living God. Hebrews 12.22 says this world's not my home. I'm going to a place that is the city of the living God. 1 Timothy 4.10 says that God has put a hope within me. The hope of the living God. I don't serve a dead God. I serve a living God. He raised him from the dead. And so I wait for him in patience and in confident expectation. Each letter that Paul wrote, he wrote for a specific reason. Each letter has a specific message. Each letter has a blessing attached to it. In Romans, uh, it's the righteousness of God revealed in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians, it's the wisdom of God and the sufficiency of Christ. In 2 Corinthians, it's the ministry of God through Christ. In Galatians, it's the liberty of God that we have in Jesus. In Ephesians, it's the riches of God in Christ Jesus. In Colossians, it's the preeminence of God's Son. And in 1 Thessalonians, it's this. Jesus is coming again. As, as we work our way through this first epistle, what we will find, if you go to the end of every chapter, every chapter ends with a remark about the coming of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. Chapter 3, verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Chapter 5, verse 23. They all tell us, they are all reiterating the fact that Jesus is coming again. See, listening to God's word will lead to living God's word. We will be examples, we will be enthusiastic, and we will live expecting, ex, in expecting the Lord to come when God's word just floods our soul and echoes out of us. Every member of a church should be imitating not just the Lord but others who are walking with Christ. Man, if I could be like Don Stevens, my mentor. Man, if I could be like Leela Pope. Man, if I could, the list goes on, does it not? You know, there are people that are watching us. I hope that one day they could say, man, I, could, I wish I could be like Tony Rogers. Wouldn't that be a glorious thought to have lived my life in such a way? An example. I should be enthusiastic when the Word of God becomes such a part of you. It cannot help but come out of you. You will be enthusiastically sharing what God has done for you. And we will daily look for the return of Christ. So, here as we are at the end, it's just time to take an inventory. Are you an example? Are you an example? Are you enthusiastic about the Word of God and the God of the Word? And are you living in expectation? of the return of Christ.